from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Thank you so much. Uh, the Washington Post is a, a proud uh, charter sponsor of the National Book Festival. And for me, it's a special honor to introduce one of the greatest historians of our time, David McCullough. <laughs> Praise for David McCullough's contribution to Americans' understanding of their history comes with each of his books. And this is his 10th. USA Today rightly declared that few historians have captured the essence of America, its rise from agrarian nation to the world's dominant power, like David McCullough. He has won the Pulitzer Prize twice and the National Book Award twice. And he is the recipient of the Presidential Medal of Freedom, our nation's highest civilian award. David's new book, The Wright Brothers, comes at a good time, because today we're seeing innovation in our society at a breathtaking pace. And this is a story of two of the most resourceful innovators ever. We can marvel today at the billion dollar valuation of a new app, but you'd have to have quite the app to transform the world as the Wright brothers did when they made the first powered flight at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina on December 17, 1903. This book is a reminder that extraordinary innovators can seem like oddballs. That's what residents of Kitty Hawk thought when they saw Wilbur and Orville Wright stand for hours watching the giant seabirds and replicating the motion of flying with their own arms and wrists. This book is a reminder that innovation requires collaboration. Orville and Wilbur did almost everything together, living together, eating together, working together six days a week, sharing a bank account. They also worked closely with their sister Catherine and with Charlie Taylor, the mechanic who repaired bicycles in their bike shop and then built a lightweight engine for the Wright Flyer. This book is a reminder that the biggest innovations don't necessarily cost a lot of money. The Wright brothers achieved their goal in four years and with less than $1,000, a sum, as the book points out, paid entirely from the modest profits of their bicycle business. Now, their closest competitor was funded by the, funded by the Smithsonian to the tune of $70,000. It then crashed into the Potomac. This book is a reminder that innovators don't have to be conventionally credentialed. Neither Wilbur nor Orville had gone to college or had any training in physics or engineering. Daniel Okrent, writing in the New York Times Sunday Book Review, said this, the Wright brothers is merely this, a story well told about what might be the most astonishing feat mankind has ever accomplished. We can use inspiration like this today and we can use the inspiration that comes by way of David McCullough. Now, interviewing David will be Melissa Block, one of NPR's great journalists, longtime voice of All Things Considered, and now a special correspondent. It is my pleasure to turn the stage over to Melissa and David McCullough. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Excuse me. Thank you all so much for coming and uh, for taking flight with David McCullough and with the Wright brothers, Wilbur and Orville. Um, I want to start by thinking about how the brothers' dream of flight began, because you describe it, you trace it back to a toy that they're given at an early age, and that this sparks something in their imagination. What was that? Their father was a great believer in the importance of toys in educating children. <clears throat> this was um, at the time when the kindergarten movement was very strong in the country and using blocks and so forth for children to learn a lot about building and, and putting together and working together and innovation of that at that level. And he brought home what the, the boys came to call the bat, and it was a simple little helicopter, uh, propellers and powered by rubber bands, which you would twist, and it would take off into the air. And he brought that in and he held it in his hands, and then all of a sudden he let it go and it flew up to the ceiling. And as each of the brothers would later recount, 
that's when it began, and they were not in any way ambivalent about that. And uh, years, some years later, but not very long, Orville was in uh, first grade, and he was whittling away with some wood, and his teacher came over and asked him what he was doing. And he said, I'm working on the kind of flying machine that my, brothers, uh, my brother and I are gonna build and fly someday. And uh, uh, this was only the beginning in many ways of the many examples of their home environment that were absolutely in, in decisive. Um, years later, Orville was asked by one of his friends, would he agree that he and his brother were perfect examples of Americans who grew up with no advantages and they had no advantages as we would think of them. No running water, no indoor plumbing, no electricity, no telephone in the house. That even with no advantages, we can rise to extraordinary achievements and heights because we're Americans. And Orville was very adamant. He said, no, that's not true because we grew up with the best advantage, the greatest advantage anybody could ever have. We grew up in a home that encouraged intellectual curiosity. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, Wilbur was later asked what he, if he had an answer to how to succeed. It's one of my favorite <laughs> quotes in the whole story. He said, yes, pick out a good mother and father and grow up in Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> And Anybody it works for them. Anybody from Ohio here? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Well, it's interesting that you, you mentioned that because they're from, they grew up largely in Dayton. Yes. And uh, Dayton at the time, at the turn of the century, was a wellspring of innovation. They were not unique in the, in the notion that they were inventing and creating things. Dayton yes, it's was not, a it's not, um, it's not an exaggeration to say that Dayton, which was not one of the larger cities, even in Ohio, was in, in, in its way the Silicon Valley of the time. In Dayton, Ohio, more patents were issued on new inventions, new products, and so forth, than based on population equivalents than any other city in the country. There was something being developed, built anew, almost everywhere you could, would turn, and they were in the midst of that, and that's extremely important. And also, of course, it's an age of innovation and invention with Alexander Graham Bell and, and uh, Edison and the invention of the elevator and, and the mousetrap. Uh, it, 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 it was, things were jumping and things were, were succeeding. And the advent of the skyscraper, it just goes on and on. And so that was a spirit in the country, which they understandably and to a very large extent rightly felt was purely American. We think about Wilbur and Orville as a unit don't we? I mean, yes. the, Wilbur, the older brother, by four years, Orville, mustache, yeah. um, elegant, always elegant, in always. suit and tie and cap. Ha, they were very different, though, in your description, a, a real force <clears throat> together. But Wilbur, you consider Wilbur to be the true genius. So how do you describe Wilbur, the difference? Wilbur was the a two? genius. Wil there's no question about it in my mind, and other people feel the same way. Uh, uh, Orville was very clever, innovative, um, mechanically adroit. No slouch. Uh, yeah, <laughs> right. And he, and, but he, Wilbur had a reach of mind far beyond Orville's. Uh, Orville was also painfully shy, as their mother had been. Their mother died when they were in their teens, and she was very good at making things, just like Orville was. Um, and Orville, the four years, made Orville the big brother. In many ways, this story is a, is a family play mm. with four characters, the father, the two brothers, and the sister. And the absence of the mother put the sister, Catherine, in a more important position than she would have had otherwise. But Wilbur was the big brother. He was the boss, always. And Orville always deferred to him. Uh, Wilbur was not afraid to speak in front of organizations in engineering or whatever, or to write proposals or to <clears throat> be the spokesman for them. 
whereas Orville refused to do any of that. Uh, Orville also had spells when he became touchy, moody, easily um, offended. In the family, they were known as his peculiar spells. Uh, Wilbur, on the other hand, would be sitting with a group of people and he would look, he would look over and he was clearly lost in his own world. He was thinking about something. And Wilbur's love of art and architecture, Wilbur's use of the English language, but this is also could be said of Orville and Catherine. They were raised by a father who believed that you not only had to know how to use the English language correctly, grammatically, but you had to know how to use the English language effectively. And their letters, which are all here in Washington at the Library of Congress, their private family letters alone number in excess of a thousand. The professional correspondence, most of which Wilbur wrote, also numbers beyond a thousand. And you go through those letters and you know, you, you know that they never went to college and further, they ne neither one ever even finished high school. And it's humbling how superbly written they are. And that's almost entirely due to their father. Now, you have to understand too, please, that yes, they had no plumbing, no, no uh, electricity, no telephone, no indoor facilities, much of any kind, but it was also a house full of books. Mm -hmm. And if there was ever an example of two extraordinary, really four extraordinary people rising to a level intellectually and in accomplishment that very few ever have, without any advantages, supposedly, because they read. And they read Shakespeare, they read Virgil, they read uh, uh, Mark Twain and Nathaniel Hawthorne, they read Sir Walter Scott. When, when <laughs> Catherine had her birthday, the brothers bought her, and she was still a young woman, bought her a bust of Sir Walter Scott. <laughs> now the idea that these are just a couple of bicycle mechanics has to be eliminated, it has to be taken away from you. Exactly. It's, um, I, Melissa, I would have wanted to have written this book even if they hadn't succeeded. Because they're that fast. What, what kind of human beings yeah. they were. Yeah. and how much we can learn from them about behavior in life. As they say, the life lessons that yeah. they taught. Yeah. And the father, too. Father was an itinerant minister who was away about half the year, always. So they had to get by on their own, which was also an important part of it. And the, um, and the sister, well, you want to go on back? We'll talk about her. Let's save we'll Catherine. We'll save her, all right. She's, fine. she's fascinating on her own. But she let's... cannot be left out of the equation. Okay, we're going to save time for Catherine. It's important to me, too. I bet a lot of people in this room have gone across the mall to the Air and Space Museum and seen the 1903 Wright Flyer yes. um, with the struts and the cloth wings and wondered how is it possible that that flew in, in December of, of yes. 1903 um, with Orville on that first flight. What is it, 120 feet, 12 seconds in the air? First, life, first flight was not very impressive. <laughs> it lasted 12 seconds, and he went 120 feet. However, and, and keep in mind, please, that this is in the midst of bitter winter on the Outer Banks, with stiff wind, cold, and, and desolate in the extreme. It was all sand virtually then. Virtually no one lived there. There were no roads. There were no, uh, no contact with the world except the telegraph office and the life-saving station. And um, they had a few people there, local people helping them. And then they took turns. They always took turns flying. And then it was Wilbur's turn, then it was Orville's turn. All that same day, <clears throat> before the day was over, Wilbur had flown more than half a mile. Uh, they had done it, no question about it. And uh, they knew that it, they had done it and that nobody in all history had ever done anything like it. And they knew that what they had done could change the world. 
which it, of course it has. Right here in Washington, D.C., 10 million people a year, 10 million fly in and out of Reagan and 10 million fly in and out of Dulles. 20 million people a year. And these aren't the biggest airports in our country. And yet we all take it for granted. Oh yeah, I'm gonna get on a plane, I'll be in Chicago in a couple hours. How did it happen? Mm -hmm. Who did it? There's a scene in Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid where they're being chased by the posse and they're riding pretty hard, but the posse keeps on coming a little faster. And one of them says, who are those guys? <laughs> and then they keep getting closer and they're running fast. And who are those guys? And then finally one of them says, who are those guys? <laughs> well, who were those guys yeah. that invented the airplane flight? And how did they do it? They did it with none of the conventional notions that we have advantage of advantage. And as it was said in the introduction, they had no training, whatever, in physics or, or science or anything like that. Totally self-taught. They had a liberal arts education. So let's please keep that in mind. Hmm. <laughs> um. Marty Baron, in his introduction, mentioned uh, how obsessed the Wright brothers were with birds and with yes. bird flight. Um, and one of the locals that he mentioned uh, on Kitty Hawk would describe them standing for hours on the beach. Uh, we couldn't help thinking they were just a pair of poor nuts. He said they could imitate every movement of the wings of those gannets, gannet birds. We thought they were crazy. Um, but this was, they, they were obsessed with studying bird flight, how they were able to stay aloft, how they banked, how they That's turned. how they cracked the case. And there were others pre preceding them, and some wonderful French writers who wrote beautiful, poetic books about the, the essential need to crack the mystery of birds. How do they do it? Why can they do it and we can't? And they did, the Wright brothers did. Now there's a turn in the story that is um, extraordinary but it's also a lesson about what they learned from the birds, and it applies also in their view, and I think they're quite right, to life. When he was about 18, Wilbur got hit in the teeth with a hockey stick, you know, big up game, local pawn. Knocked out all his upper teeth for life. Extremely painful, very slow recovering, and as a consequence, he was a very handsome young man, and very popular, and he was a great athlete, but all of a sudden, here he is with no teeth, half of his mouth. And he went into a spell, spell of what today we would call depression. And he retreated from life in self-imposed seclusion at home, in his house, for three years. And family all thought this is the worst blow that's ever happened to us. This is tragic, it's awful. What a terrible thing to have happened to our wonderful, brilliant, handsome young son. But it was during that time that he started reading as never before and started reading natural history and particularly these wonderful books about birds. And he as much as says that that's what changed his life and he could quote those passages from those books, which, by the way, were on the shelf of the family collection because his father was very interested in ornithology. When I first got involved with the research, I asked who, who hit him? <laughs> and was it intentional or accidental? Nobody knew. But in the bishop's diaries, the bishop is the father, amazing diary, after Wilbur's death, which was 1912, the father identified who it was that hit him. And he had been known in boyhood as the neighborhood bully. His father was a house painter. His name was Hay, Oliver Hay. H-A-I-G-H. -H. And his extremely poor family, and the boy was put to work as a clerk 
in a drugstore right around the corner from where the Wrights lived and where he lived. He lived right around the corner. And he, because they couldn't afford dentistry, the boy's teeth were rotting. And he was in extreme pain. And the druggist, feeling sorry for him, provided him with what was the only painkiller of the time, which was cocaine. Cocaine pills. And he became an addict. Now, whether he was a cocaine addict at the time of the, of the incident, we don't know. But later on, this same young man became one of the most notorious murderers in the history of the state of Ohio. So there you have, right in this same neighborhood, growing up genius and, and young men of the most admirable kind and really genuine evil. He murdered his mother, his father, his brother, and an estimated 12 other people. So I think what that does, certainly ought to do for us, is remind us that when we think of the virtues of growing up in a small, relatively small city in a nice quiet neighborhood, <laughs> the whole setting is very much like a Norman Rockwell painting. But it isn't that simple and never is, never was, never will be. Whether Oliver Hay did this intentionally or accidentally, we still don't know, but we shouldn't give up. Hmm. Hmm. I have never undertaken a book where I didn't find something very important that nobody had seen before or written about before. And this certainly was a vivid example of that. And of course, the excitement that comes with that, the um, sense of a light going on and, had the, and an idea of suddenly taking on a different shape and form and meaning and importance is, well, it's part of the love of learning. You remember that moment of finding that, that page oh, yeah. of the diary oh, yeah. specifically? Couldn't believe it. Yeah. Oh. And it wasn't as though the, the bishop had hidden this. Yeah. It was right in his diary. One of the many things that I find really confusing about the Wright brothers' story is that they've achieved the success in Kitty Hawk. They send a telegram home saying, I think, alert, alert the press, let the press know we've done this. They come home to Dayton, and they are flying daily, it seems, on Huffman Prairie outside of Dayton, and no one is paying them any attention. How is that possible? It's one of the hardest things to fathom about this whole story. They did it. They did it. it Kitty Hawk in front of witnesses. And they had, had done what no human being had ever done in all of history. But they weren't hooping and hollering and then doing a jig and saying, aren't we nifty and aren't we grand? <laughs> because they realized that what they had done at Kitty Hawk was only the beginning. They had to develop a plane that was practical. And that, and that plane wasn't because it couldn't bank and turn sufficiently. So they came back to Dayton and in a cow pasture eight miles out of town, they began their experience flight experiments there. And they succeeded. It took them another two or th two and a half, three years. But it was right outside of town and you could get there on an inter-urban inter trolley. It wasn't as though it was out some secret path. And the trolley had to stop right by the field where they were doing this. And nobody came out to watch. <laughs> not, the, not the newspaper reporters, <laughs> not the editors didn't send them, someone out to hey, go out and see this. And one of the editors of the one of the daily papers in Dayton was asked about this 10 or 20 years later. He said, how could that be? It was happening right under your noses. And he paused for a minute and he said, well, I guess we were just plain stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes there's no better explanation but it's than this, that. But it's this sense that so you're told that something happens and you know, oh no, everyone knows that's not true. It was the king has no clothes on. Somebody came along. And the first person, one of my favorite characters, in the, <laughs> whole, the first person to come and look and see and write it down and write it down accurately at length was a beekeeper, a, bee, a manufacturer of beekeeping equipment from up in the other corner, the northeastern corner of Ohio, named Amos Root. <laughs> Great name, Amos Root. <laughs> And he heard about what was going on down in Dayton, and he got in his car, his new automobile. <laughs> Excuse me, just keep in mind that 
automobiles are as new as airplanes and bicycles. It's the, the phenomenon. Transportation is radically changing overnight. And he came down and he saw what they were doing and he wrote his article about it. And he published it in his beekeeper's journal. Gleanings, <laughs> gleanings in bee culture. So it wasn't scientific Amer Amer American. It, it wasn't the New York Times, the Chicago Tribune, or one of the days that broke the story. It was Amos Root in his beekeeping journal. <laughs> I'm very pleased to say that Tom Hanks is going to be doing a, a mini series for HBO. Um, as he did for my John Adams book. Uh -huh. And um, the casting is shortly to begin. And I, I just hope that Paul Giamatti gets to play the beekeeper. <laughs> I, I, yeah, with full beard. And who would, be, who would you want to play Wilbur Norville? I don't know. I don't, nobody knows. It hasn't, but do you have the someone screen, in the mind? Screen, the screenplay hasn't been written yet. Yeah. That's, that's the first step. Yeah. But we do have a screenwriter. I promised that we would spend some time on Catherine Wright. She's the youngest sister. She's younger than Orville by about three years, so younger than Wilbur by about seven. She's the only one of the family to go to college. She goes to Oberlin. She's a teacher in Ohio. And she single-handedly devotes herself to her brother's life. When Orville is terribly injured in a crash, she stops teaching, she goes here to Washington to take care of him um, and lives her life with her brothers until Wilbur dies early and with her father. Something happens when she turns 52, she's fallen in love yes. with someone she's known for some time um, and she decides that she will get married and is terrified of telling Orville, her surviving brother. And he stops speaking with her, he no. never reconciles with her um, he doesn't go to her wedding. He refuses to go see her when she's dying of pneumonia just a couple of years later after she's married and has found happiness. It's only under duress that he finally goes to see her. How do you explain that? What kind of mystery can account for that? Uh, it's impossible to explain, <clears throat> but essentially, and he made this, he felt she had betrayed him, that they had an understanding that they would stay together for the rest of their lives. They had been like this all their lives. He, or Orville was much closer in childhood to Catherine than he was to Wilbur. But I'd like to uh, go back a little bit about this because nothing of any consequence or very little of any consequence is ever accomplished alone. It's a joint effort. I just heard Walter Isaacson speak about this very theme this morning wonderfully, brilliantly. And we have to remember that. I wish that uh, some of the members of Congress would remember that. <laughs> um, so it wasn't just Wilbur and Orville who did, made this happen. It was Wilbur, Orville, their father, their sister, uh, Charlie Taylor who worked with them, and the people in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania who uh, had started this, what we call startup company, little enterprise called the Aluminum Company of America. <laughs> and they built for the Wright brothers the first aluminum block for an engine in order to reduce the weight of the motor, which was crucial to having success with a motor-driven glider. Catherine, uh, I don't think the story would have turned out the way it did if, that, if she had not been part of it because she brought several things that, that they d didn't have. First of all, she was very sociable and she was good with people and she was amusing, entertaining. And she was always there when they needed her. And most dramatically when Orville nearly was killed in, here in Washington, Fort Myer. She gave up everything, came immediately to be with him and got him through it uh, in a way that he himself later said he wouldn't have gotten through it if he, she hadn't been there. And it wasn't just that she made sure he was getting the right medical attention at the base hospital, but she brought him through his, his depression, his sense that I, I'm never gonna be able to do anything ever again in my life. I'm not gonna be able to walk, I'm not gonna be able to fly, 
not only did he walk again, he flew again. And he came back and he insisted on flying again at Fort Myer, right across the Potomac River. And he not only flew again, he broke several world's records when he flew again. And that was her, she did it. And with, of course, a lot of returned determination on his part. She was also feisty, as she liked to say, and um, uh, uh, wrathy is her <laughs> other word, wrathy. She could get cross at them and keep them in line and keep them going when they, the spirits happened to get down. And when they went to France to demonstrate what they were able to do, and she came over, she was fantastic with the, with the French press, much better than either of them ever were. Mm -hmm. And they adored her because she was so opinionated and spoke her mind because, she, as they said, the French said, she was so American. <laughs> <laughs> they loved Americans who act, acted American. It's fascinating. <laughs> Wilbur Wright didn't speak a word of French, never really tried, and they loved him for it because he was so American. <laughs> and he was so handsome and so courageous and so successful. And no American had ever had anything like such popularity as Wilbur Wright had, not since Benjamin Franklin was in France. And, um, and of course, the French were crazy about aviation and the Wright brothers were way ahead of the French experimenters. There is so much more of this story that we haven't gotten to, and I want to save a couple of minutes for questions. I do want to just point out that um, in your acknowledgments, you specifically mentioned Tom Furrier, who is the person who keeps your old royal typewriter in good working order yes, right. and has for many, many years. So congratulations to Tom and to your Thanks. royal, which is going strong. Yes. Um, time for just a couple of questions if folks want to make their way to the microphones in the front of the room. Oh, I wish this could be longer. I do too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much, Mr. McCall, for being here. I wonder if you could speak a little bit about, um, you know, your book coming, what, you know, 12 years after the, the 100th anniversary, uh, a lot of been written at the time. What inspired you to go back and retell the story so beautifully? There's a letter written by Edith Wharton that appears on page 248. <laughs> and I was very interested in Edith Wharton as one of those Americans who benefited from her time in France. And in the letter, she describes how she got out of her car, the limousine that was delivering her to the Hotel de Crillon where she was staying, and on the Place de la Concorde, and the hotel still there, as is the Place, of course. And she noticed people looking up into the sky. And she looked up in the sky, and she saw, to her absolute thrilling uh, bewilder wonderment, uh, an airplane. And she, in the letter, describes how, how beautiful this spectacle was. And she knows that it's a right plane. Now, I, and when I saw that letter, read that letter, I thought, how does she know it's a right plane? What's a right plane doing flying over Paris? And she said, this is, imagine that I got to see this, the first flight of an airplane over Paris ever. Mm. Well, she didn't know this yet, but it was the first flight of an airplane over any city, anywhere in the world ever. And the, the same airplane had just flown over the top of the Eiffel Tower farther up the way, which she did not see. And the, if, she, if it had flown over the Eiffel Tower, that meant it had flown in probably about 1,400 feet in excess of the height of the Eiffel Tower. And what a spectacle, this wonder, wonderful, wonderful achievement of, of uh, structural engineering, the Eiffel Tower, and an airplane flying it over happening in Paris. Well, the flight was being flown by a young uh, French uh, aristocrat, the Comte de Lambert, who had been Wilbur's favorite best student when Wilbur was de making his demonstrations at Le Mans and Pau in France. And it was a Wright plane, which he had bought uh, from uh, the Wright brothers. 
And then I re so I've got to know more about this now. Then I realized that Orville was also in France. And what were they doing in France? They're meant to be back in a bicycle shop. Because I didn't know anything about them at that point. I knew about just about what all of us know from, knew from our 10 minutes in high school history class. They came from Ohio, they made bicycles, and they invented the airplane. OK, on to the next subject. Well, I, I have written a lot about politics and war. But the older I get, the more I think about our story as a country. Or about the story of, of human, human activity on Earth. History isn't just about politics and war. It's about art and music and finance and medicine and invention. It's about everything. It's about the human mind, the human achievement, human aspirations. And um, so I have considered this book the third in a trilogy of three books that I've tried to make that point. My book on the building of the Brooklyn Bridge, my book on the building of the Panama Canal, and the book about the Wright brothers. Mm -hmm. And um, all American achievements, all thought to have been impossible, all done against great odds, and all against serious risk of life. That has to not be forgotten. Every time these Wright brothers went up in their plane, they knew they could get killed. And they didn't just go up two or three times. They went up 50 or 100 times a year for about eight years. Now, you don't have to make any of those risks in inventing um, iPods. And, uh, <laughs> and the other thing most people don't understand is it wasn't just they invented the airplane. Yes, they did. But they invented, they figured out how to fly it. I want to make one just quick point more, please. When Wilbur was on the beach at Kitty Hawk, studying the soaring birds, he kept voluminous notes. And at one point he writes, no bird ever soared in a calm. The old Irish saying, may the wind always be at your back. He's saying no. Mm -hmm. Much better that the wind's coming at you head on because you need that wind to help you fly. And his feeling was that adversity was not just important in flight and in the understanding of the ways of technology, it was important in life. And of course, he'd had the most terrible adversity imaginable when he had the teeth knocked out. In other words, a little adversity, a little onset of problems will make you lift in life, make you try to attain a new height. And if you're, everybody's just perfectly comfortable, if everything's going just as smooth as silk, not many people are gonna try to do something uh, that might be difficult or which would require mm -hmm. that they get, out of, get up out of the chair and turn off the television. <laughs> we maybe have time if we press our luck for one more quick question. Let me just say, to start off, it's such an honor to meet you. Um, I'm studying to be a high school history teacher, and I wanted to ask you, why do you think we should be studying history? <clears throat> history is human. It's not boring. It's not statistics. It's not dates you have to memorize. It's about human beings. When in the course of human events our great document begins, and the operative word there is human. Uh, tell stories about real people, about what really happened. And get, them in, get your students involved in the research. Bring the lab technique that's used in science and bring it to the history classroom. Give them an assignment where they have to do some research about a building around the corner where three of them or four of them work on a project together to doing a biography of somebody or something. Well, they all learn together and learn from each other and keep them reading. And don't just, don't just um, require reading conventional history, textbook history. Have them read good books about history. Have them read novels that have an historic theme or setting. And, and, um, and tell them to enjoy it. <laughs> Thank you.
I cannot think of a better ending. I think we're, are we out of time? We are sadly out of time, but um, tell them to enjoy it. I think thank those are excellent words. Sure. It's been an honor. David McCullough, thank you thank so you. much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.